Okay. Thank you all for joining us again. And putting up with all this technology the hassle as we try to go ahead and uh, get things started to do this remotely. Okay, today we have Jim Penn. And we're uh, going to be teaching for the second part of class a very similar sort of class to what we uh, have been doing in your class. Well, we'll be looking at the Navis works, we're doing flash detection, as well as photo simulation. So that's kind of coming up in the second half. We're going to be joining the other group. But I want to do a couple things that are sort of specific and unique to what you guys want as we get started. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to close that slide. So that's not bothering us in the background. And I'm actually going to go switching this up on over to the Windows environment. So we can go ahead and play there. Because what I really want to talk about with you is twofold. We want to talk a little bit about some modeling things that are going on or with uh, like uh, just looking with say MEP modeling or something like that. You can do it very, very briefly in terms of getting started with that. But we also want to go ahead and take a look then at quantity takeoff and really how we can start thinking about quantities and using that tool to go ahead and start compiling estimates. So I know that's something that you need to do for the project. Okay, so sounds good? Okay, then let's go ahead and get ourselves going. Actually, in terms of Rabbit MVP, I'm trying to think, I think you guys have it available on your machine. I'm just going to open it here. Do something really simple with it, just to kind of get you started. Revit MEP is going to turn out to be so, so similar to the other Revit environments in that we're going to do a little bit of drawing and create some 3D elements. And there's really not a lot of detail we want to get into because we can spend a whole long period of time in terms of just how you do uh, like a MEP design. But at a real high level, just thinking about the ductwork and how the ductwork is going to be distributed from a central air handler to registers that are going to be in other parts of the uh, building is actually kind of a really high level thing you'd like to do just to sort of understand what the interaction between the mechanical system and the structural system might be. Because actually, classically, that's actually one of the highest uh, kind of problem areas that we typically run into. Okay, so I think you guys muted the microphone on that side. That's fine in terms of uh, not having the uh, feedback. You know, as long as everything's kind of okay, we'll just kind of keep on going. But catch me if anything's going wrong. Okay, in terms of getting going today, and maybe I just want to demonstrate this really quickly. You don't need to follow along for the first part. Is really, I'm just going to open sort of a very basic like MEP model for the same little building that we've been looking at in a lot of different senses. I'll go out to or really my Dropbox, and I think that for if you actually distributed this, or without there, where people could go ahead and take a look at it. We're under, um, oh, there's all the data sets kind of uh, brought together. Let me see if I can kind of bring it up in there. There's an MEP model. Let's bring it up over here. And I'll just open it and take a look at it. What I'm going to be looking at, it's really just a, a linked model. We've linked back to the structure or the architectural model. We can actually link the structural model in here too. But what this has is just a little bit of information about the risers, the plumbing fixtures, and the ductwork. And at a high level, let's just kind of go through the really basic concept of some high level thing you need to think about in terms of the MEP design. Okay, and let's let that finish opening up. Okay, there we go. You'll see that on top of this linked model, you're actually looking at a little bit of plumbing in that. That's what's kind of going on there, and we can take a look at that. We could also go ahead and look at some our HVAC diagrams. Let's see if there's actually anything in here. If I turn on the wireframe view, we might be able to sort of see something. As opposed to the hidden line view. Hmm, doesn't look like there's much in there yet, so we'll just go ahead and add some things in there. Okay, here's basically the issue in terms of what's going on. As we think about, like, HVAC and distributing air, one of the things that really sort of dominates as we start thinking about design is just this issue of really moving air through the building. And what we have to do in terms of moving air through the building is think about there's certain code requirements that will uh, require us to just get a certain amount of fresh air moving through the building just as a life safety thing. We need to have just fresh air moving through, exhausting the bad air, and kind of bringing in fresh air as we go. 
So as you think about that at a really high level, if you want to think about uh, MEP design, you can start to think that for any area, any part of the space, what we need to think about is changing the air. It'll be somewhere around five times an hour, just something like that. Okay, if it's a more noxious area, we'll have to change it more often than that. But for most areas, five times an hour is just sort of the code requirement or something like that. So what we can do is just sort of think about an amount of space and just figure out how many cubic feet there are and ultimately kind of figure out, ultimately, if we have to move that amount of air for every minute, really what that means in terms of how many registers, how much ductwork we need to move that in. So, for example, in this silly little building, what happens is each of these little cells is somewhere around like 30 by 30. Just by based on measuring them or sort of my familiar little building, it's kind of 30 by 30. So this total area over here is around 90 by 90, or around, I would say, 8,100 square feet if I was looking at one half of the floor. So what we think about is that 8,100 square feet, okay, that's a starting point, we think about the floor-to-floor -floor height, and maybe the floor-to-floor -floor height is, say, 10 feet. I think, I think it's 10 feet in this building. We can go ahead and check that. And we'll be able to compute the cubic feet. Okay, so my floor-to-floor -floor height here is something like 12 feet. Okay, although the actual air between the ceiling plane might be closer to 10 feet. And I can take that 8,100. I can go ahead and multiply that by either 10 or 12, depending upon whether it's an open ceiling or a closed ceiling. Okay, and then we multiply it by this factor of how many times of uh, air, an hour we need to move the air, and that might be somewhere around five. And we can divide that, so 8,100 times 10 or 12 times five times of the change of the hour, divide it by, say, 60, because we want to get not cubic feet per hour, but we want to get cubic feet per minute. And ultimately, you're going to figure out that you need to move a certain amount of air in the space. Okay. And what I figured out, because I looked at this building a little bit before, is for each of these different cells, we need to have around like a 500 to 600 square feet for each of the different cells that we're sort of moving around. So what does that actually mean? Okay. As we're thinking about ductwork, we tend to have an air handler somewhere in the building. It'll often be near the core of the building, maybe up in the attic, or up on the roof, or maybe down in the basement. And we need to move air from that out to some registers, some registers that will add air to the building and also return air, okay, pull it back in. And we'll need to have, if we're doing a good job, an even number of air distribution terminals as well as air return terminals. If those two things are out of balance, what will happen is either the doors will sort of fly open or it will be hard to open. You'll either kind of have a negative pressure and have suction or keep the doors closed or keep them open or, uh, you know, just kind of back pressure, which is to keep making it hard to open the doors. But what we tend to do is we tend to start by doing something like just adding air terminals. Okay, and on the home tab in Revit APP, you'll find air terminals. And within those, they have things like, oh, supply terminals, as well as you'll find return terminals. Okay, as well as exhaust grills. Okay, those are more for when we have just sort of a grill in the ceiling and we're actually pulling air through the ceiling plenum. But I'm just going to put in a few supply diffusers as a starting point. I can sort of say they're going to go on level three. That's fine. And I'm going to give them an offset off level three. You know, let me put them at about, say, nine feet off the floor. If that's about the ceiling level. And let's go placing some of those on the ceiling plan. I'm going to place them on the ceiling plan because they're actually going to be above my head and I want to be looking up at them. So I can put some supplies in here. What I tend to actually do, just as a strategy, is I often put supplies near the windows or near the outside walls. So I'll just put some in here on the outside surface. Now in terms of what the size of the supply is, we can go ahead and look at the supplies. These are all sort of 12 by 12s, which are sort of our 12 by 12 openings in a 24 by 24 diffuser. Or register, we call them a lot of different things. And for each of these, you can actually even go through and choose, there's a cubic feet per minute. Let me pull that over to the other side, as I usually do, just so we can sort of sell those values. And each of these is rated for a certain number of cubic feet per minute. And we can go ahead and have different ones rated at different levels, but what this is basically telling me is based on these so far, I need to basically push six times 500 or about 3,000 cubic feet per minute. Okay. Similarly, we put the supplies in here. Let me go ahead and put some returns because I'm going to pull away that air too and take it back to the air handler, which I envision being somewhere over here in the building. 
Okay? And what I'll do is go back to the home again, and I'll choose the air terminals. I will uh, choose as opposed to supply, I'll go through and return, return, or choose return, and place some of those in there. Again, oh, let me put them about 10 feet off the ground, or what if I put the last ones? I get 9 feet off the ground. I'll drop these in here. Notice the arrows are sort of even indicating, like, uh, whether I'm supplying or returning. And this is kind of just a real common strategy, is to kind of pull air towards the middle of the building and return it that way. Okay, now that's about as detailed as I'm going to get. The last thing we want to do is really just run some duct work that's going to contain these things. And really, you're not going to do the detailed design, but at least in terms of understanding the duct work, it'd be nice to know about a little bit about how you place it, because you need to think about where the duct work is going to fall relative to your structural elements. That's kind of a coordination thing that often creates troubles in buildings. So how we can look at that is as follows. Duct work is its own separate little item here. And what we do is we sort of choose kind of a type of ductwork and we sort of approximate a size and then given that approximate size, we can go through and design it in terms of really figuring out how much air is flowing through. Generally what happens is we get further and further towards the ends of the branches. The ductwork can be smaller because it has to push less air. As we move further and further back towards the, or closer and closer into the center, it will get bigger because it has to have, it sort of adds up the effect. Piping does the same thing of all the different terminals that are coming after it. So we can go through and do something where, let's go ahead and let me choose a different type here. I'll choose rectangular ducts, which are kind of nice big box ducts. They tend to be very efficient. And I can think about whether I want to have radius or mitered corners. Radius corners actually take up a little bit more space, but they're actually a little bit more efficient as a system. Mitered's a little bit easier to run just because um, we can make 90 degree corners. We don't have to allow a radius as we kind of like try to round different corners. But well, let me do the radius ones for now. We'll try that and we'll sort of see how this goes. But you'll find as we're running ductwork, one of the hardest things we typically run into is just having enough room to make the elbow connections to do what you want. So let's take a look at the ductwork. I can choose for this piece of ductwork or oh, some sort of size there, like. 12 by 12 might be a good size. You can make it 16 by 12. Again, we don't have much design data to operate on, but we can sort of just sort of put in a placeholder here and approximate from there. And let's talk about the offset. The offset is really how high to run the ductwork relative to the floor level. And what happens is if I'm putting all those registers at 9 feet, all those diffusions at 9 feet, I'll tend to have to, have to actually put the ductwork up a little bit higher and make some little connections between them. And it's actually sort of hard to kind of figure out how to get all this into the ceiling. But as a starting point, let me put that in at maybe 10 foot, 10 foot 6, just a little bit higher up, so I'll have a little bit of room to make the connections. And what I'll do is just start running duct. And I'll assume that the duct's coming here from the center of the building, where this core is, kind of radiating out towards the outside. Let me go ahead and I'll start over here near the center of the building, kind of behind the elevators. And I'm just going to start running duct work. And I'm just going to draw it as single lines. Okay. What's going to happen is as I draw ductwork and as I kind of keep on moving, you're going to see a single line drawing is going to appear. Okay. This is kind of a sort of a course level representation of what's going on. Let me kind of pull it on out here a little bit further. Okay. That's going to be the center line of the ductwork. Now, we don't actually sort of have the ductwork show up as single lines, and the reason it's showing up as single lines right now is because we have a coarse level of detail set. If I choose to a medium, okay, or a fine level of detail, you'll see that actually it is running ductwork. You can see what's going on here where as it goes through and we run ductwork, okay, it's taken all those different connections and it's done something smart in terms of putting in elbows, putting in different connection points, it's actually pretty good about what it does. So let me kind of show you another example. I'm going to run some more ductwork, maybe to pick up the kind of supply registers on this side. I'll run a piece of ductwork that's just running here. And I'm going to pull on down. Okay, but I'm not going to quite join just yet. Because what I want to do is actually kind of just look at that join explicitly. Okay, I have these two independent pieces of ductwork. If I come through now and I actually pull the connection and 
intersect that line, you'll see it'll work awfully hard to come up with what it considers to be a smart connection. And it's actually joined those two. It's put a little transition piece right in there and connected them together. So it actually is pretty smart about what it does. Let me go ahead and shift over to 3D and see if we can sort of see some of that stuff. Let me even, oh, let me kind of zoom on in here a little bit. Oh, maybe I'll shade those. Will that work? The shading is going to hide them. Let's do this. Oh, actually, you get a pretty good sense of it there. So there's my ductwork. There's my different registers. And we're sort of running ductwork and doing a pretty good job. Now, what's going to happen is when we eventually design it, this ductwork's going to get smaller at the end and get bigger when we get back towards the where the air handling unit is. But at a really high level, you can just start running ductwork through there and start understanding it. So we can understand it in the 3D views. We can start to understand it in the elevation views. We can start to understand it when we're doing a 3D coordination between things. And that's kind of at a real high level we want to sort of get you going with. Now, as you go through and kind of put in ductwork, ductwork always has this thing, and piping has the same sort of thing, where there's sort of supply ductwork and there's return ductwork. Okay, and when I go through and choose something, like this duct, Let's see if it actually, it's sort of assuming it's supply air right now. That's kind of fine. Although if we really want to make sure it understands, what we need to do is actually just connect the ductwork to some piece of uh, a register, and then it will actually really kind of commit it to being a specific system. So how we can do that, let me try a couple different ways and see if we can make this work. One is we can choose a register, and I can say connect into, and then choose a duct. And it'll try awfully hard. Okay, and oh, that's, uh, let me kind of like see what's going on. I think we have a problem there, just in terms of how I place the registers. Let me see, see if I got this down right, because I think what I have to do, I suspect my registers are upside down right now. And what I probably have to do, let me kind of flip back over to 3D again, and take a look. No, that looks about right. You kind of zoom in there again. Now that looks right in terms of what's going on. They do sort of, sort of go down like that. That's okay. Sometimes I do have this issue where like registers are upside down. That might not be the problem. Let me go back to the 3D view again and we'll try something different. If you have plenty of space, you can often get things to sort of connect into. It may be that I'm having trouble and, and I can't really do it here. So let me try something a little bit different. I'm going to go through and and just try running a piece of duct. This is sort of a very common strategy you may get into, and you'll see in a lot of buildings, where what I'm going to do is run another hard piece of duct. Maybe this can be a little bit smaller because it's not a main branch. It could be like a 12 by 12. And what I'm going to do is come from here and branch on out, and I'm going to get awfully close, but I'm not quite going to touch. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to come out of here. I'm going to get awfully close, but not quite touch. And the reason I'm doing that, and this is sort of, again, just sort of a general thing that happens an awful lot when we're running ductwork, is that what we'll do is we'll run hardline ducts really close, but for that final few inches, rather than running a hardline duct, which is very sort of unforgiving about the geometry, we'll go through and put in something called flexi duct. In flexi ducts, you can sort of picture it. It's kind of like a, a dryer coil. It's uh, kind of foil covered, springy. It's sort of very resilient in terms of what's going on. So if I go ahead and choose flexi duct, it has the sort of uh, the flexibility to often connect things that you have a hard time connecting other ways. Now, flexi duct is something you don't want to run very far. You typically only want to run it up to about six feet. You can make it a little bit longer, but we're going to keep it fairly close in because it's a relatively inefficient thing to do. But let's try running it from here to the end of there and see if we can connect in. Let me do it on another one there. I'll go from this one to the end of here. And the reason, again, we like flexi duct is it really it gives you that little bit of give and take out in the field where you'll trade off the efficiency just for having an easier installation process. So let's go back to 3D, take a look over there. Let me zoom on out. Okay. It's not representing them in very much detail. Let me go ahead and see if I can even, yeah, even at fine, it's not representing it in very much detail. But 
you can sort of see how the connection system is going to work, and this is ultimately going to kind of work out as um, really our, uh, yeah, uh, for illustrating what our system is. Okay. Other things you can do, just as a matter of kind of uh, coordinating and stuff like that, let me even try something in terms of visibility graphics to make this drawing look a little bit better. A very common thing is, and there are no filters in here right now, you can set up a filter so you can do something where, oh, just based on the type of system, it sort of shows up in a different color. Again, this is sort of like extra for experts, so don't worry about this you know, in terms of if this is sounding a little bit confusing. But if, if we want to set up, for example, mechanical supply and add that as a filter, that will choose all the supply systems. And I can go through and override, for example, all of those and maybe make them blue. So I can just identify the, oh, actually, Supply I usually do in red, and the return I'll do in blue. That's kind of a, a common convention. Let's see if we can get this to do it. If this comes on back. That's pretty ugly looking in terms of uh, not showing us what we want. Here's supply. And I'll make it solid pattern. Let's see if we can apply that. There you go. So now have all your supply systems in red. I could go ahead and sort of do a similar system as a return system in blue. But really, that's all I really want to show you at a high level about that. The big principle is think about really where your air handling location is. Think about the height that you need to sort of move on through in your ceiling plenum is. And then just think about where those main locations of the duct lines are going to be. And it often takes a lot of strategy to kind of figure out a good mapping of those relative to your structural elements. Although I imagine in your uh, PDF files, some hardworking MEP engineers probably already figured out a good routing for those, so you should be able to kind of model per their specs. Okay, so let me pause right there. I don't really want to get much further into that because I want to like, save some time for quantity takeoff, but let's just see if there's any questions about that just before we sort of move on. So uh, if you want to turn on the mic, let's just sort of see if anyone has any questions about just getting started with uh, some really basic duct work. Okay, then let's, let's not belabor it then. We have a lot of stuff we want to cover today, so hopefully that's enough to get you started a little bit in terms of what's going on. Yes? How much things the components in every MEP are compatible with actual components in the market? Actually, yeah, there's really a whole market of manufacturers now. We're providing uh, Revit components that match actual manufactured units in terms of the uh, size of the connections, the flow rates. So if you go to work for an MEP firm doing some sort of consulting like this, they'll have vast libraries of realistic components because in the same sense that we can take a structural system and do an active analysis on it, you can do the same thing for these MEP models and really do a very detailed analysis of how the air is flowing, really how you have to size the air handlers based on the, the comfort requirements. So definitely getting more realistic. Okay, good, good. Let's move to the next topic. Fantastic. Okay.